House Energy Policy Committee will come to order. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Chair? Here. Representative Hawk? Here. Barrett? Here. Cole? Here. Tedder? Here. Polino? Here. Barrington? Here. Griffin? Here. Johnson? Here. Lafave? Here. Lauer? Here. Riley? Here. Lazinski? Here. Deanda? Keebla? Here. Garrett? Camilleri? Here. Elder? Here. Green? Here. Mr. Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I uh, need a motion to approve the minutes of our last meeting. So moved. So moved without objection. So ordered. We're going to hear testimony today, a continuation of our hearing a couple weeks ago on House Bill 4220 regarding smart meters. And our first uh, witness before the committee this morning is going to be Cynthia Ayers and joining us uh, by video from Washington, D.C. And Cynthia, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Okay, so Cynthia, if you would identify yourself for the committee and then share with us your concerns and if you would uh, uh, put whatever you have to say into about five minutes. Okay. Um, Honorable Chairman, uh, Committee Representative Doug Gardner, appreciate this opportunity to speak with you today about uh, what's going on with the smart meters. Um, my concerns are task forces, our task forces concerns about the vulnerability of the electric grid. Okay. And what is your what is your task force? Uh, the task force is a task force on national and homeland defense. It's a congressionally sponsored task force. Uh, Congressman Trent Bryant uh, via the uh, EMT caucus sponsored it. Thank uh, you. I am currently the deputy director, deputy to the executive director of this task force. I've had um, almost 40 years uh, as an NSA employee. <clears throat> I'm retired from NSA. During that period of time, I spent a couple of years at CIA headquarters working uh, counterterrorism. I was in the counterterrorism center during 9-11 and the, the attacks on the USS Cole. Um, then I followed that up with an eight-year, eight-and-a-half-year stint at the U.S. Army War College teaching uh, senior officers uh, things like cyber warfare, uh, current uh, strategic threat to national security and military applications of artificial intelligence. Uh, since I retired, I retired in 2011, and since that time I've, I've become involved in, and more involved in critical infrastructure issues. And, uh, and really that's where I'm at today. I actually also am a consultant to the U.S. Army War College uh, working on electives for cyber warfare. Cynthia, thank you. Your, your credentials are well established, so tell us about your concerns with smart meters. Um, well, as, as you've already heard, I've like, listened to some of your previous testimony, smart meters are uh, essentially digital backdoors. Uh, hackers are seeking to exploit all avenues of entry to the grid in order to disrupt, degrade, and destroy computers, uh, anything that's attached to the net. If you, if you happen to be around the Johns Hopkins area, if you go to the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, there is a um, an Internet of Things laboratory there. And those young men can show you exactly how easy it is to hack into the system. They, they've shown us how easy it is to exploit the components once, once a hacker is in. You can tell when people are home or in their offices, when the building is occupied, when it's not. Who is there? Why, why uh, and, and where they are in the house or in the building. And sometimes the hacker can tell what people are up to in the building. Um, anyone who's worked on terrorism or anti-terrorism issues can immediately see the implications of, of that particular issue. If you imagine that uh, any sort of ubiqu ubiquitous uh, usage of Internet of Things technology and smart grid technology uh, can really, uh, with, a, with a coordinated effort against the country's, a country's leadership, can provide access to uh, leaders and their families to the extent where, unfortunately, representatives, representatives of nation states or terrorists could use uh, nations for targeted assassination and kidnapping. Um, second, uh, in a previous testimony, I noticed uh, Fire Chief Roddy uh, was speaking about his own experience of the fire caused at his home by a smart meter. Uh, and he installed one of that. He expressed concern that there were no surge uh, protections on these smart meters in general. Uh, this is neat. 
uh, and it's huge in a bigger way, uh, probably a bigger problem than even the fire chief imagined. Uh, heavy surges occur, uh, really much, much bigger than uh, the normal surges that you would occur on a daily basis with things like a high altitude nuclear explosion, uh, which again would be cause an attack, uh, an intentional attack against our nation. Uh, but they can also occur with great geomagnetic storm, which is uh, caused by solar flares, the coronal mass ejections from the sun. The most famous one in 1859, the Carrington event, if you've ever heard of that, it was uh, essentially the worst on record. Uh, if, if that ha uh, had occurred, if that particular coronal mass ejection had occurred today, it would have taken down electric grids across the world, all over the world, and it would have resulted in a, a massive number of fires. Um, simulations of a high altitude nuclear attack, which is also known as a, a high a EMP, electromagnetic pulse, uh, performed on buildings have given us a great deal of data on the possibility of fires or fire storms associated with the aftermath, aftermath of, of such an attack. Uh, the more smart meters we have installed means there will probably be more fires in the event of, of either one of these occurrences. And unfortunately, uh, larger firestorms and more immediate deaths. Um, in the Congressional Commission's report, uh, there's an EMP Congressional Commission. They uh, reported in 2008 that firestorms were considered a distinct possibility, especially in areas of drought, and that was with analog systems. And regardless, regardless, there, there would be less likelihood of being able to put the fires out in, in, in smart meters. In, in the more strategic context, um, access to the grid can be literally fatal to the nation. The electric grid is our center of gravity. Uh, center of gravity is the hub of all power and movement upon which <coughs> everything depends. For both military and civilian sectors, it's the source, the source of our strength. Attack on our center of gravity is intentional. It's meant to take the enemy out completely, instantaneously and long term if possible. Without electricity for a long period, we would have no water, no food, your transportation of social order and ultimate of death, the Congressional Commission estimated that within a year, and that um, the National Research Council estimated a four to 10 year recovery time after such an occurrence of either a, a solar flare or a great geomagnetic storm or the electromagnetic pulse issue. Cynthia, uh, Cynthia, let me, if you will, allow me to uh, conclude your testimony. Uh, because we have a lot of other people who want to testify. However, do any members of the committee have questions uh, from this obviously expert witness? Uh, Representative Griffin. Yes, um, thank you, Chair, and thank you for your testimony today. I do have a question. It's something that you um, addressed early on in your, in your testimony, and I just needed a little more information on this. You mentioned, and for, you can correct me if I'm a little inaccurate, but I'm trying to remember what you said here. Um, you said smart meters are backdoor cyber points of entry. Could you please explain to the committee um, uh, w more about that? Um, virtually anything can be had. Uh, I did hear your testimony from one of your, um, from someone, I forget exactly who the man was, who said that um, there was really no way of, of getting any information other than building information. Uh, a lot has to do with the way they've optimized the systems, but anything can be hacked, anything can be used for entry. Uh, I haven't been technical in many, many years, so I can't exactly tell you how personally to get into the systems, but I've seen these young men at, at uh, John Hopkins Applied Physics Lab do it, and they do it very easily. Thank you, and, and um, with permission, uh, I would like to just do one quick follow-up. Sure. So, so if you said anything can be hacked, then is it also true that um, uh, cell phones, laptops, anything else um, of similar technology can also be a backdoor entry for cyber trouble? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Cynthia, can analog meters be hacked? No, it's, uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, Representative Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your testimony. Um, to follow up on that last question about the uh, laptops and cell phones and things of that sort, uh, if those were hacked, they would not pose a threat to the entire power grid, though, correct? Um, it, it depends on the 
up to. Uh, usually the things that, that pose the most threat to the power grid would be the um, the control systems, the state systems that are hooked up to them. Uh, right, but it, it, an individual's personal cell phone or personal laptop or you know, smart TV that they're uh, uh, enjoying in their home is not going to pose a threat to the grid if it's hacked by a, uh, a, a you know, an individual with intent to do that. In this case, if you have an Internet of Things and your TV is hooked up to the network uh, and the, the smart meter provides access to the grid, then yes, it, it could actually sure. provide it. But it would be through the smart meter that that would be the, the vehicle still, correct? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Griffin. Hi, thank you. One more follow-up question for you, please. I am familiar with the EMP pulse technology and that type of stuff. Um, is it true then, you know, maybe you can educate um, the committee or explain a little bit more about um, in the event of an EMP pulse attack, um, all electrical systems would be affected. And I, and I do understand that um, if we're talking about a large electrical grid, uh, sure. Is it, is it a dangerous world? Are we all living under that threat? Yes. Um, but could you also just explain a little bit more about um, what all types of technology would be affected? And I understand that a smart meter is a piece of technology, but I think that the scope here is important because, um, you know, for, for the purposes of today, we're talking about, you know, one piece of, of technology, but in the case of an EMP attack, um, it's a much bigger problem. Thank you. Uh, it is indeed, actually, it depends on the design of the weapon. There, um, what we're worried about the most at the moment is uh, the fact that the Russians have allowed a, a, a more advanced design than we knew of before, uh, called a, well, it's actually a neutron bomb exploded in space. It's a, a totally gun-sized uh, weapon that can um, put out much more in the way of, of damaging gamma rays, and it take uh, the damage all the way to your pacemaker, uh, from what I understand. Uh, it's... Uh, a megaton size, uh, a regular nuclear weapon, as I understand it, uh, would do a great deal of damage. It could take out cars, it could take out uh, main computers, larger things. Might not take out your, your phone and your laptop. Uh, something that small would be um, a bit much for a regular size nuclear weapon. But I don't think even, uh, I, I think it's more likely at this point that an advanced weapon would be used, mainly because that is what we believe the North Koreans have been testing. Cynthia, let me, if I may, uh, cut you off there. We do, in fact, intend to have a hearing at some point later this year on the overall threat to the grid and what we can do at the state level to secure it, and we certainly want to have you back. Uh, any other members of the committee have questions about smart meters in particular? Uh, Vice Chair Halk. Yeah, thanks for your testimony. Um, as far as the smart meters having surge protectors in them, I know that there's no surge protector that you that will stop lightning. I mean, that'll pretty much blow everything out. Now, these attacks, do we have? Do we know what they will be? And do we have surge protectors in place now that will stop them? Or are they going to be so powerful that no surge protectors will be able to stop those also? Uh, there are surge protectors of sorts. I don't think they're quite called surge protectors. It depends on what we're talking about. There are the, those. There are some, there is a technology that can handle it. Unfortunately, they are not deployed, and they're certainly not deployed with smart meters yet. Any other questions? Cynthia, thank you for taking the time to be with us this morning. We will we'll be calling you back regarding the broader threat uh, to the uh, electrical grid. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, if consumers' energy will... Uh, will keep their seat for just a second. I had told them they'd be second, but I also made a commitment to Senator Colbeck, uh, given his schedule, that whenever he arrived, we'd put him up. So our next witness will be Senator Colbeck, followed by Consumers Energy. Senator, welcome to the House Energy Policy Committee. a second house member coming over to testify on a first house bill. But, uh, I want to show um, support for House Bill 4220 and for your leadership in getting this legislation moving. Um, during the recent energy policy discussion, there was a lot of discussion around system reliability and that uh, was talked about in, um, as the PowerPoint gets up here, that was talked about in context of 
uh, power generation capacity, but there's a broader issue around system reliability that I think we need to address as, a, as policymakers. And uh, I want to first express my thanks that uh, Cindy Ayers was able to come in and testify today. Um, she did this on kind of short notice. I, I've been working with Dr. Peter Pry um, on this very topic around hardening the grid. As you alluded to, we're going to have further discussions on that in the future, but uh, he provided me with Cindy as an expert um, on the smart uh, grid technology and what the impacts are, and I agree with you. The f I would li rather have the focus of this discussion on smart meters specifically. There is a much larger discussion around the security of the grid, but I think there's plenty to be concerned about specifically to with the uh, smart meters. Um, and uh, as you may know, um, my background is that I'm an aerospace engineer. I bachelor's, master's degree in aerospace engineering. I was responsible for the um, cabling design on the International Space Station for the Quest Airlock. I also worked with the Department of Defense on training simulations that are designed to train the next generation of warfighters against different threats. I say that not because I think I, I have all the answers, but I do have a pretty good understanding, I think, what some of the basic questions we should be asking as policymakers should be. And in that context, when it comes to um, reliability discussions, it is a much broader discussion than just simply the capacity of our power generation capacity in the state. And when I look at what happens with smart meters in particular, I'm concerned that it's actually putting um, our homes, our, our nation, and, uh, and frankly, even some of the power suppliers at, at significant risk. And uh, I don't know if we're quite ready for the presentation yet, but I'm going to skip ahead here. And one key thing I want to make sure people understand is the fact that um, smart meter itself is, a, is the foundational component of what they call a smart grid. And that's kind of what uh, Cindy was focused on was the overall grid implications on it, not simply um, the individual smart meter. But these are like the basic Lego blocks of a smart grid. So if this Lego block goes south, oops. Sorry, we've been hacked. No. <laughs> um, so these are foundational components. This is a picture of the smart meter that I have outside of my home. And uh, Representative Griffin, to your point about hack access points, there's a little knob right up on the front there with a special tool. You can actually bypass all the rest of the firewalls, get into that directly, and unless that tool is under control, you have an access point. Now, it only puts, it to Representative Barrett's point, it only puts the AMI itself, this local, region, local network at risk, but it's conceivable that that could be hacked and extended into other areas of the grid as well. Um, but uh, I want to make sure that we're talking about what is the real risk here with the smart meters. These are foundational components of these smart grids, um, and they connect essentially every home to uh, AMI, a digital communications network. Unlike an analog meter, which is just simply reading the current coming into the home, um, these smart meters uh, are both they take information from the home and they actually provide, they have uh, ability to put control signals to shut off power as well. Senator, if I can just note for committee members, you have a copy of his presentation, uh, paper yep. copy. So. so I'm not going to go through all these uh, various security threats, but the key word that I want to highlight is that Remember, in context of our energy policy discussion, the key thing was about availability of power. And uh, when you actually go off and do a detailed analysis, as they did at the uh, California State University on Sacramento, of what all the threats are, and I've done similar analyses before as an engineer as failure modes and effects analyses, they highlighted that availability was one of the key consequences of these various security threats. That means the system reliability is at risk. That means that the power that's provided to our homes, to our businesses, and to our government offices here are uh, at, put at risk with the addition of these smart meters. That is a risk that is not um, entertained when you have an analog meter. So I just want to put these into yep, yep, three broad categories, national security, Cindy Ayers already addressed that, business liability I want to talk about, and family security. So national security, this is James Woolsey, former CIA director, a so-called smart grid that is vulnerable. Um, as what we've got is not smart at all, is really a stupid grid. And she's highlighted what some of the concerns were. Now, this is a real risk. This is something that is filed if you go into the business risk associated with for consumers and for DTE. Under their SEC 10K filings, they have to list the business risk. Under those business risks, the cybersecurity of their system 
is specifically highlighted as one of the key concerns because that shuts down their business operations. Now, they just so happen to have the government as a risk backstop in that context, but it doesn't make it any less of a risk. This is a very real risk. This is not a pie-in-the-sky idea. Now, let's get back down to brass tacks. What happens to our families? What risks are we put in place with that? When we actually look at the smart meters that are in place right now in our homes, there's no surge protection, which leads to fires. There's no conducted emissions filter, which leads to premature appliance failures. There's a cybersecurity backdoor, as we talked about earlier. Um, and also something that hasn't been talked about is this infrared light emission that can be used by bad guys to identify whether or not somebody's at home or not, because this just flashes based on the rate of energy consumption in your home. And there's uh, no circuit breaker between the meter and the power source, which also leads to fire. So with that being said, I implore the committee members here to take this uh, House Bill 4220 very seriously. The risk that's proposed or that's in that uh, um, embedded in the adoption of the smart meter technology is not a risk that's inherent with analog meters, and we should at least give our consumers a choice as to whether or not they have at, they uh, adopt the smart meter technology or not. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Any questions from the committee for the senator? Okay, seeing none. Thank you. I'm sorry, Representative Camilleri. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, too, for your testimony. So I guess my question revolves around the um, issues of national security. Yeah. So if other states are already using smart meters, which they are, and they're already susceptible to hacking the grid, as they are, if this is the concern that we're raising today, what would change if Michigan were to go away from using smart meters, having only analog meters, and how would that impact national security? Well, first of all, it would take one point of failure out of the equation. So that's the smart meter, which is that basic building block. The approaches that a lot of states have done, including the state of California, is that when you do a failure modes and effects analysis, you identify all the different controls that you can put into place to mitigate that risk as much as possible. Those controls cost a lot of, bit, a lot of money that, that ultimately our consumers are going to be the ones um, left holding the bag in regards to paying for all these other risk mitigation efforts. And so then it begs the question, what is the fundamental consumer benefit associated with these, con with these smart meters? Right now, they're getting sacked with a lot of extra costs associated with them, but what is the actual consumer benefit? And we as uh, representatives of our constituents and policymakers, <coughs> it is our duty, first and foremost, to represent the best interests of our constituents. I'd ask you to refrain from that if you can, out of respect for the chair. Thank you very much. Any follow-up, Representative? Okay. Any other questions? Um, I would note that uh, Attorney General Bill Schuette in a court filing said he found there was no benefit to homeowners from having these installed and, in fact, said uh, he thought the utilities had no constitutional authority to charge any fees for not having them installed. And I would note, to bring the committee back to the attention of this bill in particular, we're not talking about it in 4220 eliminating the smart technology or eliminating the grid, but simply letting an individual homeowner who's concerned about what we've heard so far and other considerations uh, give them the freedom to choose to protect their home if they see fit. Uh, Senator, thank you very much. Uh, Consumers Energy folks, if you would uh, come up and uh, again, if you would limit your comments to five minutes. And folks, we've got so many cards, I can just tell you in advance, not everybody who put in a card is going to get to testify today. And it would be my intention next Tuesday at the meeting, our meeting, not to take additional testimony, but to have the bill up for a vote. That's my, that's my intention. You guys turn on the red button, identify yourselves, and pro proceed. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Good morning. This one? Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Lisa DeLacy, Executive Director of the Smart Energy Program at Consumers Energy, and with me is Dennis McKee, one of our two uh, Smart Energy Communications Directors. And we are here to testify in opposition to House Bill 4220. But before I talked about our concerns about the proposed bill, I wanted to share a little bit about Consumers Energy and a little bit about the Smart Energy Program. So first I wanted to start real foundational with uh, consumers energy in order to deliver electric power relies on a whole distribution system to do that. And parts of those, the components that make up that distribution system are substations, poles, wires, 
transformers, voltage regulators, and the electric meter. The electric meter is an essential element of that system and is foundational to having an accurate billing system. So these, um, and I will say too, over the course of consumers' um, history, we do make investments that have customer value, and smart energy is not an exception to that. There are value, there is value with these meters. Customers get an approved bill accuracy. They get online data about their consumption. We get outage notifications. We get to modernize the grid. And more importantly, and to the point of uh, one of the elements of the bill, is it alleviates the need for consumers' energy to go into homes and yards to read the meters, to get a meter read. The other element that is foundational for these uh, upgraded meters are the new voluntary customer programs that we get to offer, like peak power savers, uh, time of use pricing, and pay my way. So presently we have over 1.4 million upgraded meters across the state, and by the end of this year we will be done and at 1.8 million uh, upgraded meters. And although we began the installation back in 2012, we did have several years of research uh, deciding on what would be our technology solution for our customers. And we decided uh, on a point-to-point -point cellular technology. And that is unique. We're the first um, large utility to make that choice. And our technology choice depends and utilizes the existing cellular network and it greatly reduces the security and privacy concerns. And each, each day, there's one encrypted text message sent with whole house consumption from the meter to consumer's energy, and it contains no personal data. There's no names, there's no addresses, and there's no account numbers in that transmission. And again, that's the uniqueness of our solution, is it's a point from the meter to consumer's energy, point-to-point -point technology. After deciding the technology, we decided on a robust and uh, multifaceted communication strategy. We were excited about the technology and what it was going to be for our customers. So we started about a year in advance of a meter installation with community outreach. And then a month in advance, we'll send a postcard to the customer. Two weeks in advance, we send a letter. A week in advance, we'll make a phone call to the customer, letting them know in the following week that they're going to get their upgraded meter. And the day of the installation will hang a door card. In all of this written material, if customers have questions or concerns, we have our phone number and our web address. If a customer does want to opt out, we have a conversation with a customer. We want to understand their concerns, and we also want to explain the benefits of the meters. So it's a real treated on an individual basis, trying to get to that best solution for our customer. Very proud of our communications strategy, and we've seen improved customer satisfaction with that. Um, from the time that we started, we had a 40% improvement in customer satisfaction, and most recently we've had a 140% improvement in customer satisfaction for customers that went through our experience of the um, upfront communication all the way through to the meter installation. Over 99.55% of our customers have accepted the meter technology, but we know that, and we have an option for customers that did not want to choose that option. And so we call that our non-transmitting meter uh, program, and it utilizes a digital non-communicating meter, and it is structured for the customers that um, participate in that program um, are paying the cost for those programs. So in conclusion, uh, Consumers Energy does have significant concerns uh, about the proposed regulation. Um, it conflicts with existing data privacy and security policies. It would impair our um, ability to deliver um, safe, accurate, and cost-effective service to our customers. And it does shift costs from customers uh, with the older technology to customers that have accepted the newer technologies. And I did bring um, examples of the different meter technologies. Um, so all the way to the right here, we have our obsolete, the older technology, the analog meter. Tricking me here. In the middle is the digital. 
meter, and then all the way over here is okay. the um, Thank you for your testimony bill. this morning. Anybody have any questions for consumers? Uh, Representative Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for uh, coming in to testify today. Uh, I wanted to ask you a, a few questions, if I may. Um, if an individual wanted to opt out, does Consumers Energy notify them that there are opt-out procedures, or is it incumbent upon the individual to call and inquire on that on their own? It does require outreach to consumers, so they either can call us, they can go to the website, or they can, if the installer's there, have a conversation with the installer, but the installer will um, forward them to the call center. There's no notification that an individual may opt out. There, that's completely left out of all the communications. You would have to self initiate that conversation? Yeah, it's handled under the phrase of if a customer has a concern or a question. Okay. We don't use, if you're asking whether we have opt out those words in our uh, material. Or anything that would lead an individual to believe they could opt out. Our website specifically has uh, But none of the communication that goes to the houses would, 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 okay. would lead an individual to believe they could opt out if they chose to. I would believe that would be under questions and concerns, but there is no language that says opt out. You are correct. Okay. And then um, you mentioned that there's only one text message sent a day that has your entire total use. And whole home consumption, yes. Um, how do you then, how are you able to then identify the time of use discounts that you were describing? So it's broken up by hour. <clears throat> so the, the text message that comes through is only done once a day, but it is much more granular in its, yes, in its composition. Yep. Okay. And then um, are you able to completely be certain that a, a smart meter would be unhackable from an individual intent on trying to compromise it? So you can't control the grid from the smart meter. And well, that wasn't if, my question, though. If you hack the smart meter, you're going to get consumption data, and so there's no personal information there. Could an individual hack a smart meter to disable an individual's energy capability, so to essentially turn it off so that the home would go dark? I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it's very improbable. There are field um, uh, controls in place and also controls back at our firewall and within our um, internal infrastructure. Okay. And then, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry to ask so many questions. I just had a couple left. Um, the $10 that is um, purported to cost uh, to go out and manually read a grid, um, I believe I've been notified by consumers that my grid or my uh, um, meter is, is going to be swapped out at some point soon. Um, if I maintain the same consumption over that time, would I have a $10 savings afterward? So uh, let me explain the pricing for the program. The pricing is really based on the cost of that particular program. And so there are three major components that make up that pricing. One is to maintain the older infrastructure, so actually the, the equipment that the meter reader has. It's also to have either the people or the systems costs related to the exceptions process. And then it's also an element of restoring the premise to our standard meter configuration when, when a customer moves out. I am sorry. I'm, I'm just an army grunt, and I didn't understand a word of that. Okay, ask so your I question apologize. again. I'm sorry. Um, so if I suppose I used, I don't know, what an average, uh, whatever it was, uh, 100 kilowatt hours or something like that, and then the next month I consume the same amount, would I have the $10 savings once the smart meter is installed at my home? I'm confused by your question about savings. I'm not well, sure. Well, I, I suppose if I were to keep my standard meter, there's the assumption that it costs the grid $10 for me to maintain that, correct? Otherwise, it wouldn't be justified to have the $10 a month surcharge. I think I'm not explaining the cost of service model very well because it's not, I wouldn't characterize I it guess as a I guess maybe I could simplify it. Um, by my understanding, if I were to choose to maintain the the non-communicating meter, mm -hmm. right, or opt out of the smart meter technology. Yep. Consumers would maintain that that's about a $70 front upfront cost and then a $10 a month thereafter charge for them to have someone manually come out and read and my smart meter, to read the meter. Such, yes. um, if I were to go with the smart meter and have the same consumption as I had the month before the smart meter was installed to the month after, would I then achieve a $10 savings to, to mitigate that cost to the grid? Otherwise, I don't see how you could charge me the $10. And 70 And 70 and the, and the $70 up front, I suppose. The, uh, the cost of service, you want to give it a try? Yeah, we've got uh, the, what we've uh, explained to the Michigan Public Service Commission, our legislators, and the 
and in the hundreds of meetings that we've had around the state, is that it's a $750 million program with a $1.9 billion benefit to our customers. So the question naturally is, will we see a drop in rates? And the answer is, we will be able to control our costs going forward, but you're not necessarily going to see a drop in rates because of this change in this aspect of our business. There are so many other elements that go into the rates for serving our customers, maintaining a reliable system. Well, Mike, so, I, I think, can I, sure. can I jump in? Absolutely, Mr. Chair. I, I think uh, Representative Barrett's question, as I understand it, is you claim that it costs the utility $70 up front and $10 a month if you keep your analog meter. If somebody agrees to take the smart meter, why don't they get $70 off, uh, a premium off their bill, and $10 a month off their bill? If it's costing you not to have the smart meter, then why don't you give that customer a rebate if they accept the smart meter? Yeah. I think it's the difference between what is our standard right now and then what it's costing to do the exceptions process around people that keep their meter. And so you're trying, for the cost of service model, you're trying to allocate cost to those that are, thank you, um, in the program. So I'm not trying to make it sound real complicated, but it is more complicated than mm. what we're saying. Um, the costs, Mr. Chairman, are borne by the folks, that one half of 1% who opt out. So those existing costs are divided among, for, those. among those customers. So, so the other customers are getting the benefits of the upgrade as well as recognizing that over the long term, we will be able to control our costs better with this technology. Yeah, and, and, and my concern, honestly, as the sponsor of the bill, is what I perceive to be the compulsory nature of it. You either take them or we're going to take your money. And I note that you went to the PSC more, most recently to seek to double it to a $200 upfront fee and $20 a month, which the PSC thankfully uh, rejected. Uh, but it's the compulsory nature. If I, I'm not again. I, I'm not. I don't think the purpose of the bill is to argue the benefits of smart technology. Uh, we heard some testimony today that says maybe we should consider the broader question from a security standpoint. But if it's such a tiny percentage, I don't understand the big fight about letting folks choose for themselves without this compulsion of either take it or pay up. You know, yeah, one, one way or the other. Philosophically, the cost shift. Again, out of respect for the chair, even if you agree with that, please <coughs> reserve. Anybody other questions? I just Re had Representative Barrett? That's okay. Sorry, my last question. Um, I, I posted something about this bill on a community Facebook page in my district and had about 120 comments from individuals, and it happened to coincide with around the time when consumers was coming through the area to upgrade meters to the smart technology. And quite a few people mentioned that their bills went up substantially after the smart meter was installed. In fact, there was a, um, I believe News 10 did a, a story about this, about, you know, um, people feeling that their bills had gone up. Some people said they doubled. Some people said they went up substantially. Um, what would you suggest that I advise those uh, constituents of mine that have called to complain about that to me? Yeah, I can, I can answer that. So the, the meters are accurate. They are 100% tested by the manufacturer, and then we test each a sample size out of each shipment. For the investigations that we have done for um, high bills, they have come down to um, main, some main reasons, and those are uh, a change in customer consumption, which the customer can go out to their um, online data and confirm. There are also um, past due balances that have been attributed to that high bill. Most recently, even a budget plan adjustment um, that happened uh, caused uh, the bill to go up. Because remember, the bill is, you know, um, not just consumption. So that, that's why that past due comes in there. So we have not found any evidence of an inaccurate meter as being the source of a high bill. There's other root causes. Who's in favor of the bill? Okay. Thank you, Representative. Any more, Representative Barrett? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, Representative Kivala. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Continuing on uh, what I, the line of questioning I started a few meetings ago. Uh, again, my concern is not why someone would want to opt out, but again, the cost. A and this comes from you know the fact that I'm from remote areas of the Upper Peninsula, where some of my ratepayers, residential ratepayers, are paying 24 cents a kilowatt hour, and some of my customers are likely to live five miles away from the next neighbor, okay? So running out to check someone's meter 
if there's a rate case uh, to be made in front of the Public Service Commission, those charges could be significantly more than five or ten dollars a month. Okay, knowing that those costs, my fears, those costs are put onto someone else. So my question is, um, if this bill were to pass, and five dollars would be the cap that someone would would pay to opt out. Who will pay that remainder? Now, I was asked at the first meeting to go ahead and ask the Public Service Commission that question, which I did, uh, keeping in mind they're the guardian of the ratepayer. They have to look at your utility's case and determine what is fair for your compensation back. And they've done that. They've ruled on that already. Who pays the difference? Because talking to fellow committee members, uh, the feeling is that, well, it shouldn't go to the other ratepayers, make the utility themselves pay for it, or somehow the shareholders will pay for that. Could you please explain, if you can, and maybe it's, it's uh, not your area, but who, in fact, the utility is and who those costs get socialized to? Yeah, it's the other customers. So the customers that are um, agreeing or keeping their old technology, if they're not paying that, that shifts. That's a subsidy through the customers that accepted the new technology. Okay, M Mr. Chair, if I could just clarify. Um, there seems to be a question all the time, and, and uh, my colleague uh, mentioned the $10 savings and why we haven't seen that. You know, if you went to a law office 30 years ago, people were using typewriters. And through time, we, they started using word processors and now computers to do their work. We didn't see a reduction in your hourly rate okay, when they went to word processors or computers. They kept up with time and technology. If you went back to those offices today and said, okay, now this office is going to use typewriters, do it for the same expense, I don't think uh, you would see the, the same. I mean, technology moves on. The fact that the utilities have moved on to smart meters, and, and we don't have a great deal of them up north, but it's across the country, across the globe, I don't think it's out of hand that the costs that the utilities are talking about um, are unreasonable. So again, I just want to go back to, are we fairly uh, compensating the utilities for the people that opt out? Because my fear all along is that the additional costs go on to the ratepayers that don't deserve, especially when they're paying 24 cents a kilowatt hour. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Keevil. I'd note that the bill does allow for people to self-read, which I believe the utilities already allow. And in that case, there would be no need for a meter reader or maybe once a year as the bill provides. But uh, Representative Tedder. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I'll first begin by saying that philosophically, you know, I, I wholeheartedly support an individual's right to, to opt out, to, to go with a non-reporting digital meter, um, but um, I, have, I have similar broad questions. I don't know if they're all going to be answered today, but the, the fundamental question is, you know, as one person asserts their rights, which I wholeheartedly support, does, at what cost is that to their neighbor? And um, again, I don't know if we're going to answer that today, but if you could tell me how many people currently opt out at the present? So we have, um, we like to think of it the other way, that how many people have uh, accepted the meter technology. So that's 99.55%. But the number of actual customers that have opted out is right around 7,000. Okay. All right. That Can was. Yeah, point? go ahead. Can I also add one point is that, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Tedder, uh, initially when we saw opt-outs, part of that reason was because uh, there was a lot of information, misunderstandings. Um, that we corrected on our, our web page that our customers could go to to better understand the specifics about the smart energy program of consumers energy. Oftentimes people would take general information from other places and try to apply it erroneously to the consumers energy program. So we did a lot of outreach and in doing so we spoke with a lot of customers who initially opted out for reasons that aren't even based on the technology that we're using. And we've had more than 3,000 customers who initially opted out, opt back in and take the new technology once they understood um, the facts about our program. And um, yeah, if I, if I may continue, so you're looking at about $70,000 a month providing that, you, uh, in, that you're collecting off of those rate payers. Um, just curious, 
and again, something perhaps um, you could report back on, but you know, how many people does it take to to cover that number of customers, and um, you know, and what is the cost? You know, I I live in a more uh, consolidated area certainly than Representative Kivala, but as fewer fewer people opt opt out of the service. Um, there's 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 naturally a cost associated with that. So I I don't know. I'm not in your business. And I'm not advocating for for or against uh, your business model. But um, it seems that seventy thousand dollars may uh, fall significantly short to cover the costs associated with with the reading. I don't know. I'd I'd like to know the answer to that. And um, also um, maybe uh, think about how um, you envision. A self-reporting model because what what I what I would perceive is maybe a smartphone captures a, a photo of an individual's meter they email it to somebody that person receives that information they enter it into a data a, a spreadsheet or some sort of program what is the cost associated with that um, and again I wholeheartedly um, support I like chair Glenn I care not the reason why people don't want us want a smart meter but again um, you know we represent each of us representing approximately 90,000 people we need to make sure that those costs are borne by those that seek to opt out thank you yeah philosophically the I think that is the question about the um, opt-out costs so and originally when those um, cost structures were um, calculated it was based on an assumption that 1.5 percent of our customer base would opt out and as I shared earlier we have about 0.5 percent so the costs have remained about the same and we're spreading it across a smaller uh, customer population um, did you want to I, think it's, I think it's also worth mentioning uh, the number of meter readers that we would have to maintain to answer your question directly, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have 335 meter readers in the state right now. We expect the smart energy program to affect 200 meter readers. We will need 200 less meter readers. We will still need approximately 135 meter readers across the state to continue reading the opt-out customers' meters as well as reading the meters of our gas-only customers for now. Um, just from a pure geography perspective, right? Yeah, and so that gives you an idea of the numbers that we're talking about. And then you, you uh, asked about, um, about uh, self-reporting. Uh, self-reporting still requires meter readers, and we still have to confirm those reads. Uh, we do know what the bill says, uh, Mr. Chairman, but we also know, as a matter of fact, in conducting our business, that we need to read meters to confirm the reads of individuals and to ensure that accuracy is maintained. That's one of the reasons why we're utilizing the technology that we're doing, to eliminate estimated meter reads. And those reads by the customers continue to be estimated meter reads. And, and we know that customers are not satisfied when we go out and read a meter and say they've read the meter and there's some sort of inaccuracy there. That catch-up bill is a big deal to a customer. Uh, uh, for whatever it's worth, members of the committee, you know, we heard testimony two weeks ago about uh, 5,000 homes being estimated to have to be rewired to be able to accept meter, uh, to, to accept the smart meters, and that means the people who don't use smart meters are subsidizing your cost of installing them and rewiring those houses if, in fact, that's the case. So, I mean, this subsidy thing goes back and forth, uh, but if in fact it is entirely as you say it is and the subsidy only goes one way and uh, I, I was not a math major but I did a quick calculation here if 7,000 constitutes one half of one percent and they're paying right now hundred ninety dollars the first year uh, to opt out that totals 1.3 million uh, the remaining total number of customers if my math was correct is about 1.54 million we have 1.8 million electric Okay, so 1.8 million, and that means uh, that would mean it's even less. So that means it would be somewhere in the area of uh, 65 cents a year if everybody else was paying for the cost of the $190 that's being charged to uh, somebody who wants to opt out. Representative Lisinski. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I have a question um, following up on, on this line of thinking around the Public Service Commission hearing that was held. So I went and read the documents pertaining to this matter um, in the most recent rate case last week, um, Tuesday afternoon. So I'm trying to clarify my understanding around that. So when I, when I looked at um, the ruling itself, um, it highlighted what you stated, that instead of approximately 1.2, 1.5% um, of folks opting out, we're only, you're down at about 0.55 or 0.6% opting out. And my understanding of the ruling was not that the Public Service Commission um, described the rate that you had proposed, the increased rate that you had proposed as um, inappropriate, but rather that because the percent of customers opting out was <laughs> different than what the original calculation had been done that they recommended that you wait that consumers wait until the end of the installation period at the end of this year to determine what that true and actual rate of opt out yep, is you understood that before yep. calculating the rate so it wasn't that there was a determination made that the rate proposed by consumers was too high but rather that because there were fewer um, the folks were more just implied than that that larger cost of keeping maintaining and reading had to be spread across a different number of people than originally calculated yeah you understood that correctly um, I took that in just my simple language I, to wait for certainty wait till you know how many mm -hmm. people have really opted out and they requested that instead you roll that into your next major rate mm -hmm. case so that a determination could be made when correct. the actual number of opt-outs was determined so there was no determination made on whether or not that was a true and appropriate rate in front of the Commission but rather a decision made to wait until the numbers were certain so That's that true. a true and appropriate rate could be determined okay um, so with that said we um, and the way a regulated utility is operated on a cost recovery basis where the Public Service Commission was saying they didn't feel they had enough information in front of them to make an ongoing rate decision for that and when it was appropriate okay um, so looking then at um, impairing you listed three ways that this would um, you, you had opposition to mm -hmm. this. Um, so cost shifting, um, impairing safe and accurate delivery, and the third one which you actually mentioned first was conflicts. Could you please state that one again for me? Sure, yeah. Th there is uh, an existing, in particular, there's an existing data privacy tariff uh, that we have with the Michigan Public Service Commission, and it covers many of the aspects. For example, one element about um, how we share information you know that it can't go to a third party it can't be sold those are already existing in the data privacy tariff that we have today and so looking at that and, and trying to look on i think as everyone can appreciate a public service commission ruling in these rate cases i mean they'd be stacked up taller than i am so i wasn't able to go through all of it to determine points of um um, congruence and um, conflict between between this bill and uh, what we have in place. If we're looking at your current opt-out process and looking at this bill, your major points of conflict around the opt-out itself, not around the data portions of this bill, but around the opt-out itself, are those um, purely around um, the fees that are associated? The cost shift, yes. The cost shifting, yep, the different it. fees that are established, okay. And for that we do have a process in place um, to determine that and a, a closer to date certain in that we know that this installation process will be completed approximately by the end of this year and then a, an appropriate rate could be set as at the beginning of 2018? Yes, with our next rate case, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Representative Fave. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question was asked and answered by other distinguished members of the committee. Thank you. Sir, Representative Riley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you already mentioned or one of our uh, representatives asked the question about the taking photos of the uh, meters to self-read. Is there a program in place right now to do that? Um, there's not a, there is not a program to do that. It can be done. Uh, it is a bit problematic at times. Uh, I think you can appreciate if someone takes a picture with their phone that sometimes they're not actually even taking a picture of the electric meter. We've gotten water meters sent to us and such. Um, sometimes the quality of the picture uh, makes the read indistinguishable. So I'm not going to say it's impossible because I think you could work through it, but there are some challenges to that. Okay, and uh, would you say that these uh, newer readers are easier to read than the uh, analog meters? 
Are the analog meters easier to read than the current meters? Or about, would you say they're both the same? Both of them are easily read. I think the digital is easier because it actually tells you the number instead of guessing which dial is closer to which number. That's me personally. For meter readers obviously read. do it. That would be for the physical read, and of yes. course the remote read would be the smart meter. Okay, thank you. Representative Elder. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question has been asked and answered. Great. Consumers, folks, thank you for your testimony this morning. Thank you for Appreciate time. that. Uh, Thank you very much. Next up, we're going to have Midland County, former Midland County Commissioner Dan McGillivray. And then behind him, if David Lanier would be prepared to come forward. And then uh, after him, James Taylor from the Charter Township of Van Buren. And uh, Mr. Taylor, it might be of uh, interest to you that we have, in discussions with some of the municipalities, the M Township Association Munis Municipal League, that we're going to separate water meters out. That's our intention, to separate water meters out of this bill into a separate bill. But you're certainly welcome to testify if you wish, nonetheless. So, Commissioner McGilvery. Yes, I was shown how to up but I forgot <laughs> I can't do it things have changed from when I came down we got somebody coming to help you there okay um, mr. chairman and representatives there thank you so much mm -hmm. and it's up <clears throat> thank you mr. chair for this opportunity to address my concern with the smart meters and house bill 4220 this morning I'm coming before you as a former Midland County Commissioner and I'm one of those who called consumers and agreed to pay to keep my analog meter and I was told I could keep the analog meter for now many of my friends think I'm crazy for paying for something not to be installed I believe it's a cheap insurance to protect my finances during this time of transition true privacy security health and safety are valid concerns but to my way of thinking, the financial impact is the biggest threat to our way of life. I believe this smart meter revolution could be the final nail in the coffin of the middle class. The lower class will still get their rent and utilities paid by the government. The upper class won't be bothered by doubling and more of the electric bill. But the middle class will have to drastically adjust their budgets to keep their homes. You can see on the chart behind me here what's happening in Australia how they started out in 25 with the, the lower rates. For example, the first one was 1749 in 2005. Uh, in 2009, it was 1749. In 2010, when they got the smart meter, it went to 8601. And in 2016, it's $126. From $17 to $126 increases because of smart meeting. You see even more drastic ones on the chart. I couldn't find any other countries that have done this, but um, I was thankful to get this one. Here are some other examples. United Kingdom, energy bills almost double in six years. New figures from uswitch.com show that a third of the consumers say their household energy has become unaffordable and that the cost of heating their home is a main financial concern ahead of the rising cost of food and mortgage payments. In Burbank, California, a person posted, I live in Stocktail area, a 2,400 square foot home. I've always had a PG&E bill that runs around 400 a month. During the summer, the hottest time of the year, my bill had gotten up to 800. In walks smart meter. My bill is consistently between 800 and 900 every month. What's going to happen this summer? The truth hurts. My house has had two bills over $600 in the roughly eight months since they installed the new smart meter. We're extremely happy with our bill in the neighborhood of two to 300. We live in a 14 square foot house in the Orlando area it has been completely redone with new air conditioning, new windows, new insulation, new roof, and new gas-powered heater. Posted by Kilowatt. 
We actually moved out of our house last summer for an upgrade, everything to make it more energy efficient. When our bill doubled from 200 to over 400 between November and December, I was shocked. Mm -hmm. In closing, for those examples and many more, we believe we must be able to keep our analog meters at least for the time being. I suggest that it's not the user who's taking advantage of the utility companies, but the utility companies that are doubling and tripling its profits by simply installing new meters. I propose the utility companies look at the historical data for each user, base their bills on that, and give back the money that they normally stole from the trusting cu customers. I greatly appreciate your work on Bill 4220, and I urge you to specify that we can keep our analog meters. Then vote yes on House Bill 4220 as introduced by Chairman Glenn with bipartisan support. But please, don't stop there. If with the old meters we're getting more power than believed and consumers are still making a profit, as any good monopoly will, then homes with smart meters are not suddenly using more power and should get a much lower per kilowatt hour until serious discussion can occur to make it fair for all. If I'm using the power, I need to pay for it. But at a reasonable rate, no matter what meter I have. I would love to s see you do away with electric monopolies in Michigan. Commissioner will address that larger question as the year proceeds. <laughs> Uh, but uh, thank you for your testimony. One real, real quick. Real quick. Um, have, the, have various come in with, with or without smart meters. And this I just received yesterday, according to a new study published by IEEE and carried out in University of Twenty in collaboration with Amsterdam University Applied Sciences. Smart meters give false readings that are up to 582 percent higher than actual energy consumption. Commissioner, I saw that article. Uh, do you remember what publication that was in? I, I'm not sure. I, I got his email, and um, yeah, I don't remember which uh, something. Uh, some. Copy of that from my distribution. Okay, good. Any questions for Commissioner McGilvery? Uh, Representative Lauer. Thank you, Commissioner. I was just curious. Are you comfortable with the fact that the chart you've cited here came off of Wikipedia or? Are you familiar with any other sourcing of that that chart? No, I'm not. I just Wikipedia. Thank you. thank you. Any other questions? If not, thank you, Commissioner and David Lanier. Thank you. And if you would, sir, let's uh, let's give it three, four minutes. You got it. Okay, uh, I did provide you with some uh, information today that you can look at. It'll give a little more detail of what I'm going to talk about. But there are people here today and people not here today who are suffering from electromagnetic frequency uh, problems that are caused from this, uh, from the, uh, uh, not, uh, I should say, the, the radio frequency that's emitted by these smart meters. And... Uh, understand about radio frequency it's emitted in all directions it goes it's not just a plane it's all it's three-dimensional it goes everywhere and the federal communications commission is what the uh, power companies use to determine whether this radiation is safe or not and the way it's tested is it determined whether it heats our bodies when we get get in proximity to it in other words if we don't cook we're safe. This is the way they, they figure it. There's nothing beyond that. And the testing that's been done with the, with the smart meters is one subject will get near the meter, and if, they, if their body cells don't heat up, it's determined to be safe. The reason people can't come here today and others that are here that are having difficulty with, uh, with what's going on here in Lansing particularly is the fact that within four uh, mile radius of where we are today, there are over 100 cell towers and over 450 uh, antennas. These are relay ant antennas that, that relay the information. The smart meters, when they radiate, when they give off the radio frequency, it either goes to another smart meter or goes to a collector meter. And from there, it goes usually to a cell tower. It may go to the to a satellite, we don't know where it goes, but these radiations are going out in all directions. 
few years ago, I met with the uh, Michigan Public Service Commission, and I asked them if any test was ever done as to the the aggregate effect of all of the meters. In some cases, apartment buildings will have 30 or 40 me meters on a wall in the in the apartment building. So we know if we get near them, our bodies don't cook. But what if we get near 40 of them? Or what if we're hypersensitive? Some people are more sensitive than others. So I asked them if there was any test done as to the cumulative effect. And I provided you with the answer from the MPSC, which was emailed to me. And you can look at it when you go over the material that I gave you. But they said no. <coughs> there was never any, any, anything done in that effect. So I just want to bring to your attention the fact that these meters are, there's more going on than, than meets the eye. It's not just one meter. It's thousands, in this case, millions of meters throughout the state. And the reason some people are, are better off where they are, the one lady lives in Ann Arbor, the other one I believe in she is in Sheboygan. In those areas, there aren't 100, square, 100 uh, cell towers within a four-mile radius of where they are. It's not that, that dense. But here in Lansing, it's extremely dense. And uh, I would think that you would consider this and give people the opportunity to opt out and get the analog meter so they can live safely in their own homes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lanier. Any questions for Mr. Lanier? If not, Mr. Taylor, did you wish to testify? James Taylor with Charter Township of Van Buren. Welcome, sir. Thank you. I, I just wanted to uh, thank the chairman that uh, you are addressing my primary concern. So I'm going to be very brief. I spent two hours on the road, so I can get at least one minute here. So Yes, sir. <laughs> um, no, um, I've been in the business for 27 years with two different communities um, dealing with water and sewer services, public utility services. And the metering that we are talking about here, the smart metering, I think by its very nature is very different than the metering that we're using with our water utilities. And I just want to, I just want to make that decision. Distinction. The thing is, is that these are ma managed by local government agencies. Uh, these are public water utilities and, and sanitary s collection systems. They are they are not under the the purview, so to speak, of the Michigan Public Service Commission. But they're actually regulated by the MDEQ and the EPA. And I think, that as as probably has been determined, that would be a more appropriate venue to to take a look at our metering and see if there are some things that we need to do in our industry. And with that, I'll just close my testimony unless there's any questions, sir. Thank you, sir. It was not my intention as a sponsor of the bill to put uh, the uh, municipal utilities under the authority of the PSC since you are not now. So yes. we're going to carve out the water meters and utilities into a separate bill for later consideration. Yes, and we'll be very happy to cooperate with any information, anything you need regarding that. We'd be more than happy to help you. Great. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Uh, next up, Michelle Risen. If she is here. Michelle, I know we heard from you two weeks ago, but I understand you've got something new to add. So yes. if you would take three, four minutes. Um, okay. Well, I have, I'm going to stick to my prepared statement, although I have there'll three be, things. There will be time for questions afterwards. Okay. Great. Um, today I will talk on meter choice legislation in other states, data tracking, and the high costs of electronic meters. I'm Michelle Risen, an environmental engineer, receiving my bachelor's degree from Michigan Technological University. I've been studying the effects of smart meters since 2011. Electronic metering technology enables data tracking, which is a property rights, security, and privacy issue. Disputes involving electronic metering continue to escalate, including a Michigan foreclosure and a murder investigation. I will also discuss some of the undisclosed costs associated with this technology. Though first, an update about utility meter choice legislation in other states. There are 21 utilities within 11 states that currently have an analog option for the consumers, three states with statewide analog options, and five states in addition to Michigan are considering analog choice. The state of New Hampshire passed a regulation in 2012 requiring the utilities to get the property owner's consent to put smart meters on their homes. The state recognized that a smart meter can serve as a communications portal to electrical appliances, equipment, and devices, and potentially communicate, monitor, or control them. This is an infringement on a homeowner's property rights if not consented to. 
while House Bill 4220 does not require consent for a smart or electronic meter, it does provide for property rights protection on an individual basis. As New Hampshire recognized, data tracking, also referred to as privacy, goes hand in hand with property rights. Having a smart meter on the home provides a gateway to gaining information about the activity within the home. Analog meters do not allow for data capture, tracking, and misuse. Further, the utility in New Hampshire was able to address the goals of grid management without using smart meters. I'm going to say a bit about the high cost of the electronic meters. Early next week, we will be providing written comments from a financial expert who has over 30 years accounting experience. The following is just one illustration that there is so much more to the story. As we speak, a utility is asking the Arizona Public Service Commission to increase rates that include replacing smart meters that were installed just seven years ago. Their smart meters are using 2G and 3G networks, which are becoming obsolete. Analog meters, however, are not dependent on any networking technology ever. During a congressional hearing, Mr. Bennett Gaines, Senior Vice President of First Energy, stated that smart meters are computers and as such have a lifespan of five to seven years. He also said that retiring smart meters to counter obsolescence needs to occur for two reasons. Obsolescence due to technological advances in computer hardware and software and also obsolescence induced by cyber threats. In a rapidly changing technological environment, smart meters, not analog meters, are the devices that become obsolete. As New Hampshire recognized, the smart meter is more than a metering device. It is a networked computer. The IRS's useful life for computers uses a depreciation schedule of five years. While the utilities have spread the smart meter rollout costs over a 20-year accounting window, it is now known that the useful life of smart meter equipment is closer to seven to 10 years. Since computers do not last 20 years, this misleading accounting method makes it appear as though the smart meters are less expensive than they really are. While we've been led to believe that analog meters are obsolete, the exact opposite is the truth. The last, they last 20 to 50 years. It's obvious that several smart meters will need to be installed on each utility customer's house in the life of one analog meter. Consider as well that each of these smart meters is more expensive than a simple analog meter. The savings in favor of the durable, reliable, safe analog meter speaks loudly for itself. To summarize, analog meters prevent intentional and unintentional trespassing into our homes. Analog meters guarantee our individual sovereignty, providing an impenetrable barrier a demarcation between the utility and the customer that smart and electronic meters are not capable of. And when you read the written testimony addressing analog meter cost savings versus illusional smart meter cost savings, you will see things in a different light. Ms. Risen, are you pretty close there? Please vote to move House Bill 4020, 4220 out of committee, please. Thank you. You had that timed perfectly. Uh, <laughs> committee members, any questions for Ms. Risen? Uh, Representative Lesensky. At the beginning of your testimony, you had referenced a murder trial. Was a full and appropriate legal search warrant forced? Um, there is someone who's going to speak more on that if they have an opportunity. It's actually, I, 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 all I can say is that the person is being... Um, accused of murder based on the usage of their water meter. Of their water meter? Yes. In this case, yes. Thank you. Yes. But there's someone who can give you details on that if they have an opportunity to speak today. Any other questions for Ms. R Representative Griffin? Hi. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, some Something you said I'd just like a little more information on. Perhaps you, you mentioned that smart meters are networked computers. Um, need a little more, more information on that. Uh, I understand that technology, as we all know, um, can be very small these days. We all have phones, uh, but I just don't. I I don't understand um, 
that statement. Could you elaborate? I will try. Uh, hopefully Bill will be able to tell you more. The, the IRS also includes that they can be electronically activated. To be, to have the remote on and off, they need to be networked in some way. The, the DTE system is networked as far as a radio mesh network. It talks, the smart meter talks to the smart meter next to it. That's why it's called a radio mesh. SECO, Consumers Energy Meter, is, speaks to the cell tower. It's a cellular point-to-point -point system. Once the information, it then goes to their um, headquarters and is all in, in tied within the, um, their system network. That, that's the best I can do at this moment. Any other questions? One more, Representative Griffin. Just one. I'm going back sure. to the consumer's testimony. Um, y you, and forgive me because we're trying to really, we're, we're in the weeds a little bit, but yes. help me understand. Sure. So I was there too. <laughs> um, the point-to-point -point, uh, communication, um, I do, it, it is here that um, the consumers actually mentioned point-to-point -point cellular network, uh, but I don't understand how um, the ability of to improve efficiency of um, of reporting of 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 energy consumption is I guess is a is a is an evil thing or or, or, or something that can be um, misused. Could you could you help me with that a little bit? The consumers in their 2016 and 2015 rate cases specifically spoke about an 800, the necessity of an 800 megahertz intras, intranetwork system. They needed an extra million dollars for that because of the reliability of the, the cellular network. Um, so there, there is, the, the Bill will speak more on this. That's probably the best I can do on that. Any other questions? I'm going to assume this bill you're referring to is William Bathgate. Yes. And uh, William, if you, you would step now. William, yep. I remember two weeks ago you spent three and a half minutes of your five minutes saying stuff other than your testimony. So I want you to get right to it today. <laughs> okay. You have um, on your tables um, three documents, or three, I think four documents for me. Bill, I want you to move closer to that microphone, Sorry. please. Let me get this uh, up here. Hold on a second. It's on. <coughs> so the primary document I have in front of you is this big blue document. You can follow along if you like. 30 seconds have now All passed. Right. So. so. I'll make an opening statement. Um, in my role as program manager for Emerson Electric on similar products like the smart meter, uh, very frankly, if I had brought this to market with the defects that are inherent in the design, I'd have gotten fired. It's that simple. So let me go on. you see that? Yes. Okay. So let me get to it. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about, the meter accuracy in your bill. Um, discussions about the accuracy of the meters and all this kind of discussion. Uh, that's questionable, and I'll tell you why. The testing is done to the American National Standards Institute, Section C12.1. In that standard, there is no gold standard baseline for testing. In other words, there's no benchmark. There's no standards, weights, and measure characteristics that are in that standard. In addition, there is no timing sequencing standard. In other words, this is now a computer, and a computer is very reliant on the time and what it's doing with time. So um, just wanted to bring that to your attention. Uh, these tests that have been done have not been done with a variety of loads. They're typically done with a series of, of resistant light, bulb, light bulbs, no electric motors, no mixing of them, no uh, variable supplies of any kind. So 
the, sub the suspect relative to their accuracy. And I can tell you from testing that's true. So one thing people don't realize is that if you have an electric motor in your home, this is what that curve looks like. It's a half a second. Okay. Now, the meters, we don't know how they're internally programmed. We have no visibility to that. Okay. But here's how the thing could possibly go wrong, and I can tell you from personal experience that this can go wrong. So let's say we're going to capture electric motors in addition to light bulbs in our scenario. So in order to do that, you need to have a sample window of half a second, approximately. Okay. So in this particular example I painted here, this is over a 10 second window, and I've got surges from an electric fan on a motor in a, in a heating a heating system or a refrigerator kicking in. These all cause that surge you saw in that diagram. Now, there's two ways to calculate this. One is to totalize it, just like the analog meter, it's a totalizing meter, just like a gas pump is a totalizing meter. Okay? Or you can do an averaging of the peaks. I have reason to suspect that the meters, because of the increases in the bills, are doing something different than a totalizing meter would provide. This may explain why when people go from an analog meter to a smart meter, suddenly their bills go up. Okay, Because this is not measured to a gold standard. This is a compute computational analysis by the computer. Okay, So here's my home in Howell. Uh, before I moved in, I was not there living there, and so I basically turned off all the breakers, and I had the Energy Insight app, and I did just wanted to see what was, what was the meter costing me to run. Okay, so this thing cost me approximately 31 cents a day just to run the meter. Nothing was on; all the breakers were off. Okay, and you can see that this is not a simple text message anymore. You can see they're reading the meter constantly all day long. Okay? Sometimes more intense than others. And so you can see some of them, many, many hours worth of information is being transferred. So what is going on? It's not a text message. Okay? So how does this impact the environment? Well, if you do the math, for me, I'm paying about $113 a year to just run the meter out of my wallet. The, the, the utilities don't pay this. Okay. Bill, Bill, let's wrap it up here, please, sir. All right. So if you look at the total cost of the consumer, it's a little less than half a billion, half a billion dollars, 3.3 billion kilowatts, and 7.83 tons of carbon dioxide being injected into the atmosphere. So this thing doesn't save anybody any money. It's not saving the en energy. It's not saving CO2 of the hope is not not pollute the planet and all that. So what happens to your bills? Okay, so here's the example. They Bill, do. I'm going to ask you to wrap it up and off, offer committee members an opportunity to ask any questions they may have. Sure. Mr. Bathgate, uh, Representative Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You mentioned um, that there's a cost, um, I guess, for the electricity to run the smart meter yes. that is borne by the uh, customer. Uh, would that also be true of an analog meter? Because they would require no. energy to function. Correct? The analog meter has a resistance of about a half a ohm across the coil. It's so small you can't pick it up. I mean, it's just it's not going to amount to a, a dime's worth of electricity. Promoted. Okay, thank you. Thank Any you, other Mr. questions Chair. of Mr. Bathgate? Uh, looks like not. Um, um, Representative Griff, I have a question on the networking thing. If you want to respond to Representative Griffin's question, take 30 seconds and do so. Your question regarding the network? Give her the answer, sir. It's it basically DTE uses a mesh network, and basically each, each home talks to another home, which then talks to a, a hub, and then that hub talks to a repeater on a tower, and then that goes back to the, uh, the electric uh, center. Okay, Mr. Bathgate, thank, thank you, you for your testimony. We have 36 additional cards submitted for people who say they're in favor of the legislation. Uh, we're not going to have time for them to speak. We've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six people who submitted cards in opposition, and those will be a matter of record. Uh, I, I thank everybody for their testimony. The purpose of this bill is to address the fact that this is a monopoly system in which people do not have the freedom to choose to remove themselves from that system. They can't chop around to uh, find the uh, installation of technology they want. 
so they, they, uh, unless they just don't have electricity at all, which I don't think is a realistic option in today's world. And I would uh, correct the math that I estimated a few uh, minutes ago that uh, when I actually put the calculator to it, as opposed to the $190 that would be paid by a person opting out, uh, if it were spread around, if you, if you buy the whole cost shifting thing, which I don't, but if you do, it amounts to 72 cents a year for the remaining 1.8 uh, million uh, if, uh, if there is in fact some type of cost shifting uh, compared to 190 bucks, which for example, the uh, TV report from Detroit about the 92 year old lady who was blind, uh, who had her power cut off because she padlocked her analog meter, 190 bucks might mean something in terms of her household budget. It is my intention uh, to uh, work with all interested parties. We're going to amend the bill to take the water meters out of it, as I said earlier, address some other concerns, have a substitute uh, ready for examination next meeting on the 14th, and uh, if the votes are there to move it, we'll have a vote. If uh, we need further work after that, that'll be fine as well. But thank you all for attending. I apologize that we didn't have uh, several hours more to allow you all to have an opportunity. And committee members with that, the, excuse me. And I need a uh, motion to excuse absent members. Representative Lisinski makes that motion without objection so ordered. Thank you, members of the committee. Committee is adjourned.